Welcome to Duality Check, the podcast where two brothers embark on a thrilling journey through the realms of scientific inquiry, the enigmatic mysteries of the past, and the uncharted territories of spirituality. Join us as we explore the wonders of our world and beyond, all while embracing the roles of curious bystanders rather than experts. Together we'll unravel the intricate tapestry of existence, blending the dichotomies of knowledge and wonder. Get ready to question, ponder, and delve into the dualities that shape our understanding of reality on Duality Check. I'm Drew. And I'm Dean. Welcome back for episode Episode 11. 11. Man, we're cooking. Yeah, we are. Um... So, so uh, <laughs> it wasn't too long ago that we did uh, part two. Yeah, so it, in our time, time, in our recording timeline here, we're uh, two days after we recorded the last episode um, oh, because Drew was sick last week, so we skipped a week of recording. So Yeah, so we just recorded two days ago for episode 10. Right. We're now recording episode 11. So, so in the meantime, I've had a bunch of weird... Um, technical issues with the website so hopefully by the time you guys hear this podcast those will all be solved but uh if the if not then uh i will be starting from scratch i will be uh yeah there's a good chance i may have to delete our website and create it from scratch again to create the podcast feed from scratch again and all that which would be you gotta start with you gotta do the website too because that's where the feed is coming from yeah so the website creates our rss Mm -hmm. feed and it's that rss feed that gets brought in by and it's causing the the, issues most likely and the rss feed is linking to mp3s improperly this was all me trying to troubleshoot another issue and i made a bigger one so but hopefully um you know quickly we'll get that taken care of and for people who are listening far into the future you probably don't care because it's probably all fixed yeah, by now. for sure <laughs> so uh today we decided to go for part three of secret history of the part world three, yeah we uh we were looking at our you know list of episodes coming up and we decided we needed some more time on a few of the other ones that we had planned to do mm-hmm. now and probably our next episode too but but honestly the like i think we should keep moving on this so like, i think so once too. we're finished with this series we can move on to stuff. like a new book series yeah you know? yeah no, i agree some other books and I honestly to cover in this sort of detail yeah and i don't know if we'll cover every single chapter of this book i mean we'll probably cover parts of every chapter of this book but probably not yeah. like as the beginning few chapters like five six chapters are like really yeah that's kind of like kind of foundation for like the yeah. entire mythology of the creation mm-hmm. of the universe and the mystery school stuff and like getting their yeah. like understanding right. of how they right. think about these things so like right. further chapters you can kind of just take snippets out of and mm-hmm. it kind of a lot of it relates back to what's already been discussed in the first few chapters yeah. so yeah yeah but yeah, so we're on to part three. We finished, I th- believe we finished on the Lucifer. Yes. The um, In the Light of the World. Mm-hmm. That was the last, that was the chapter. last chapter we covered. Yep. So this chapter, chapter five, uh, I guess we, I mean, if you want to dive right into it, we don't really have any communications to yeah, speak no, of. Let's hop in. Let's hop into it. So chapter five of... Secret History of the World by Mark Booth is called The Gods Who Loved Women, The Nephilim, The Genetic Engineering of Humankind, The Fish Gods, The Original History of the Origin of the Species. That's the title and subtitle of the chapter. So we'll start. We are now about to look into one of the murkier and more shameful episodes in the history of the world. Hmm. Even within the secret societies, a veil is sometimes drawn. A priest in Babylon at the time of Alexander the Great was one of the first historians. It is clear from the few remaining fragments that 
um, Barosus, like Herodotus before him, had studied the king's list, ins- king's lists inscribed on temple walls and delved into the secret priestly archives. The fragments that survive contain teachings on the history of the origins of the earth and sky and the race of hermaphrodites, the pre-sexual humans who reproduce by the means of parthenogenesis. Yeah, we covered that a bit in the last mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Barosis goes on to describe how the land came to be inhabited by a primitive race. Then one day, he says, a monster emerged on the seashore, an animal called Oannes, whose whole body was that of a fish. Under the fish's head, under the fish's head, he had another head with feet also below, similar to those of man subjoined to the fish's tail so he had a fish head and human legs is this how you spell oannes yeah no (laughs) yes yeah no that's right whose body was that of a fish under the fish's head he had another head with feet also also below similar to those of man subjoined to the fish's tail that's interesting so he, had, he basically had two bodies, it sounds like, conjoined into one. A fish's yeah. head underneath, which he had a human-like he- head and feet, which was conjoined also with fish's feet, fi- uh, fish um, bottom half, fish's tail. His voice and language were articulate and human and human, and representations of, representation of him is preserved even to this day. This monster was accustomed to pass the day among men, but took no food, <clears throat> but took no, no food then, and he gave them an insight into letters and sciences and arts of every kind. He taught, he taught them to construct cities, to found temples, <clears throat> excuse me, to compile laws and explain to them the principles of geometric knowledge, geometrical knowledge. He made them distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect fruits and in short, he instructed them in everything which could soften manners and humanize their lives. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and when the sun had set, this being Oannes returned again to, into the sea and passed the night in, in the sea, for he was amphibious. After this appeared other animals like Oannes. Similar stories of fish gods who suddenly appear and become the teachers of mankind can be found in other traditions. For example, the Indian stories about Matsya, the first avatar of Vishnu, and the stories of the ancient um, Phoenicians of the of the dragon, of the Dagon, sorry, (laughs) who taught humankind the art of irrigation, and the ancient fish gods of the Dagon Dagon tribe in West Africa. We even know from Plutarch that the earliest representations of Zeus were of a man with a fish tail. An image which survived in Greek mythology in the form of his brother Poseidon. <coughs> so the yeah, early depictions of Zeus were of a fish. Yeah. So it sounds like the God. early, yeah, before they had like split off Zeus and Poseidon into their own entities. Yeah. So Poseidon being the brother of Zeus in mythology, but having basically come from him, it sounds like. Yeah. From the story of him. This is the. Uh, Images oh, yeah. that come up for Oannes. Yeah, so there's a fish head. At top. It's like it's almost like he's wearing a fish outfit. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Graham talks about Oannes uh-huh. too. Yeah, he um, talks about Oannes and, and being the teacher of the ancient societies and mm-hmm. of agriculture and. For Graham, all. it's a symbol of uh, Pisces, right? The after the. Uh, ice age of the uh and after the cataclysm and the pre-civilization got wiped out it's the it's the symbol of the rebirth symbol of the whoever had knowledge of the previous civilization coming up out of the sea and finding bestowing and bestowing knowledge. knowledge and that sort of turning into a fish god metaphor well yeah i mean you gotta think even still right so like if it was an ancient and that's the thing about time and like like the relative time like we don't know that the events 
of like we know in like a materialistic form like of like how old, old things are mm -hmm. but we don't really know like it's like the idea that the uh, what's that what's it called the last thursdayism it's like the you, have you heard of that uh it rings a bell but i don't exactly know it's like it the idea it's like the idea that that you can't prove that the entire oh like universe every, and that everything that was happened before last thursday right so like it's kind of this idea of like yeah like we we have an understanding that things are old but do we like we can't necessarily prove that everything wasn't created to look old or be yeah. seen as old. Well, it all gets extra murky when we're talking about mythology and trying to date things based off of mythology because, A, we don't even know that the mythology refers to something real. B, if it sure. does, we don't know to what extent it's metaphor, to what extent it, it's... Uh, it's derived it's, instead of... It's, like, literal. Yeah, instead of... And being then... A lot of times, the stories don't necessarily come with like dates passed down in them. Right, it's more like ages and times. And so, if they do refer to something real, it's hard to know how far back. Because you can't carbon date a myth, right? You know, yeah. But it's fascinating. The other, like, I mean, if this was talking about like like the rest of this book has been so far, it's like talking about the beginnings of time, right? Like, could this symbol be a recurring theme? Right. So like, could these gods be something, you know, and this even goes to like UFO is like the, the current UFO stuff. And like, mm -hmm. especially Chris blood. So that we had talked about recently, like if it is like a spiritual thing and it comes in recurring patterns and, or it's like allowed to come back at certain times to, to manifest to humans and like, you know, start giving us some kind of knowledge or helping us along our path or whatever available of, of, evolution yeah like this these these myths and stories being what they are could be just a recurring theme so yeah it could be that in you know twelve thousand years ago when society needed to be reset there was this fish you know symbol god that came down and whether it was just from a prehistorical thing they probably knew about the stories of before too of the origins of the universe and like yeah you know so it could just be this recurring theme and it's always like this thematic theme that like it is needed to put the images in humans brain in order to like have some kind of significance right? and right. allow us to like believe what's going on, I guess. I don't know. But as it's far as what he's portraying in the story here and when it's portrayed, mm -hmm. this is portrayed as whilst humans are not whatever humans is. Yet. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> proto version of humans yeah. the atom that exists mm -hmm. at the time who's still hermaphroditic right is essentially being approached by this god and being taught skills and civilization like yeah like and this is before we're even like fully formed and fully like you know human like animals right yet so we'll continue here some modern writers outside the esoteric traditions have seen in this fish imagery evidence for an alien invasion in ancient times. It's even been suggested that the human race was genetically engineered by alien invaders, mm -hmm. which, it is, which is a good illustration of the way that esoteric traditions are misinterpreted, misinterpreted by people who impose a materialistic gloss on them. Genesis 6, 1... Six, uh, chapter six, passages one through five says, And it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, <coughs> saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took wives which they chose. When the sons of God came in, in unto the daughters of men, that they bear children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness, wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Interesting. So that kind of goes straight to the 
like it kind of jumps. Yeah, and this goes is like to the Nephilim. The Nephilim, and, yeah, the yeah. giants. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the original giants, which are like kind of like demigods, yeah. right? They're born of god of godly men to human women. Right. So this is like discussing the god class mating with early humans. Right. What on earth are we to make of this passage? The phrase here translated as sons of God is elsewhere in the Bible, a phrase used to mean angels, Mm -hmm. messengers coming down from heaven. But in the context, coming down also seems to carry with it moral opprobrium by saying that the angels had sex with women. Is Genesis perhaps saying that these angels lowered themselves to participate in the material world? And perhaps that they had become too enamored with it. Right. Is that from... So that's Genesis, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, and that's a, that's an interesting point he points out there. That, like, that they didn't just lower themselves from heaven to earth, but the lowering was also, like, a moral lowering. A moral in, lowering. In, like... That they're not just that they're sort of lowering themselves to our moral plane. They're becoming physical and not wanting to and return not to ethereal their ethereal form that they were once. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder what that like symbolizes in this proto-human way. You know. I don't know. We'll continue though. Okay. <laughs> um. So this goes on to talk about um, the book of Enoch. Um, this book disappeared from mainstream esoteric history in AD 300 through 400, but traditions regarding its existence, its contents and teachings were preserved in Freemasonry. Then in 1773, some very tattered scripts of it were tracked down in Ethiopian monasteries by the Scottish explorer, James Bruce. And in this way, the old Freemasonic traditions were vindicated. Never part of the canon of Christian scripture as it as it was put together in the fourth century, the Book of Enoch was nevertheless sufficiently um, esteemed by writers of the New Testament for them for them to quote from it, evidently viewing it as an authority with a status something like sacred scripture. So this is what the book of Enoch has to say about angels who loved women. Enoch chapter one, uh, chapter six, um, passages one through four. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters and the angels, the children of heaven saw and lusted after them and said to one another, come, let us choose ourselves wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And all the others um, together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they began to go into, in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments, and they became pregnant. Later Enoch was, is given a tour of the heavens where the rebel angels or watchers ask Enoch to intercede with God on their behalf. But when Enoch tries to do so, God only repudiates them, sending Enoch back. And go say to the watchers, or angels, and go say to the, to the watchers who have sent thee to intercede for them, you should intercede for men and not men for you. Mm-hmm. So this is the angels having Enoch do their bidding and go talk to God. They let him in. They like go, you know. Go tell them that we're doing the work of, you know, whatever. And, right. And God's like, Because they don't want to face up to them because yeah, they, they, they know, know they've been doing stuff they're not supposed to. Yeah, and to. Enoch's like, okay. Because <laughs> yeah, he's like, true. you know, he's having like, some experience with these angels. I got these freaking angel, <laughs> godlike angel things telling me to go do them a favor. I'm like, right. all right, whatever. Yeah, and then God's like, dude. This is your job. What are you guys, what are you doing sending men to come talk to me? Like, yeah. this is supposed to be your, this is what I sent you there for, you know, to be the, yeah. the, the intermediary for, for man, not right. the other way around. Yeah. So Enoch, it, it continues on Enoch and this goes to Enoch chapter six, 50, uh, passages 15 through 16. Wherefore have ye let 
left the high, holy, and eternal heaven, and lain with women, and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, and taken to yourselves wives, and done like the children of earth, and begotten giants as your sons. And thou, though you might, you were spiritual beings living the eternal life, you have defiled yourselves with the blood of women, and have begotten children with the blood of flesh, and blood, and blood as those who also who die and perish. And now as, as to the watchers who have sent thee to intercede for them, who have been af aforetime in heaven, say to them, you have been in heaven, but all of the mysteries had not yet been revealed to you. And you knew worth, worthless ones, but these in the hardness of your hearts <coughs> you have made known to women and though and through these mysteries women and men work much evil on earth say to them therefore you have no peace <coughs> saying that to the watchers that you have no peace right so is that just kind of I mean, like it's a basically way of saying, blaming the corruption of mankind on, on them, them <coughs> for like bringing a bunch of impure thoughts and whatnot bunch of desire and impurity well and that's basically goes back to the lucifer um idea right. like lose the fall of lucifer in the last chapter mm -hmm. and him and his angels you know you know they're the ones who are the gods now that are defiling themselves with women. right and it's funny this is also bringing me back to a waspy again too but it's essentially <coughs> Like it's saying to the to the watchers that hey like yeah you resided in heaven and you worked for us up here and you thought you knew it all but you didn't know it all yet like not everything had even been revealed to you yet and now here you are lowering yourselves and dividing you yourself are with the women and thinking you're divine and you still don't even have the whole picture you still have to learn you're still children of of heaven basically you're right. still the ones learning the ways of heaven but I sent you there on this mission basically to to help along their path and in so learning more about yourself right it's mm -hmm. kind of the idea like it's kind of yeah. like the vibe you get is like doing this task and 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 doing it for god you will then earn yourself a, a higher place as least it's kind of the you know mm -hmm. um, what you kind of uh, assume is what he's meaning by that like Look, you haven't even learned everything, so right, and that's why I say it reminds me of a waspy because in a waspy there's like levels of heavens, right, and it's only like the most highly um, accomplished and ascended of the spirits of the you know quote unquote gods that like can interact directly with like the creator of all. There's like higher and higher levels to be attained. Yeah. Um, and so like even the gods who are like high enough to be able to like run Earth don't are necessarily not. have like the secrets of the cosmos of the universe. Right. They've got enough to, to act as gods on Earth. Yeah. Because it's a materialistic place now. You know, it's, it's becoming that. Right. And according to Owaspi, they suggest like the there's like... Uh, there's like a heavens around the earth that mm. like you as humans when you die and move on those are the heavens that you go to that's mm. which is like spiritual preparation for with higher levels for moving to the higher levels. heavens on outside and beyond that but you have to like grasp just as that. like life is like a sort of preparation for the afterlife that first level of the heavens is like preparation. a preparation for whatever is beyond mm. Yeah, we definitely need to do some Mawaspi. <clears throat> it just uh, that kind of aligns with the idea that these like great spiritual beings don't have the full picture, right? They're not just they're not the end all be all of gods, right? So we'll continue now. We have seen that the Bible connect contains encoded within it accounts of creation in which key roles have been played by Saturn, Earth, the Sun, Venus, and the Moon. We have followed the story from the pure, purely material to the vegetable to the first stirrings of animal life. The age that followed would be marked by the arrival of the gods of the solar system. Jupiter, or Zeus, as he is known to the Greeks, become, became the king of all gods, of all the gods. 
the gods of Mars and Mercury would fly into view during this age too. <clears throat> the infant Jupiter had to be hidden from the, his father Saturn. Mother Earth kept Jupiter on the island of Crete in a cave deep underground, isolated from the other gods. Jupiter lived on the milk of a goat nymph and ate the honey of sacred bees. Mother Earth hid Jupiter in this cave because she was afraid that Saturn and the Titans, the elder sons and the daughters of Saturn, <clears throat> Saturn being Satan, this one that came down mm. and, you know, defiled itself among humans, right? We got its uh, sons? Um, no. Or is that just Lucifer? Now you're mixing the up Venus. Satan and, and, yeah. and Lucifer again. Right, but I mean... Satan was the one that did battle with, with the mother, mother goddess yeah, right. originally. Brought darkness. Got it. Yeah, so she's hiding him from Saturn. She knew that um, would that Saturn would come to destroy him. She knew that the birth of Jupiter showed that the reign of Saturn was coming to an end. But the transition from one age to another is always a painful one. The older one always, the old order always tries to stay on beyond its allotted time. Mm. The Titans referred to, referred earlier to, were Saturn, Saturn's enforcers. They were the consciousness eaters. They wanted to swallow up the new life and create and create what uh, Milton, who knew all about the secret history, called a universe of death. That's what they're trying to create. So this is Satan's Titans coming to Earth, trying to create this universe of death. Mm -hmm. The Titans would always be the enemies of Jupiter. They failed to kill him while he was still an infant, but they did not cease to wage war on him. Spor um, sporadically um, and in great battles until finally and decisively Jupiter, Jupiter defeated them and imprisoned them underground. There, these great forces of materialism became part of the very structure of the Earth. And whenever volcanoes rumbled and threatened to erupt, the ancients heard their discon discontent. Mm. So they're basically thrown into the depths of Earth, becoming yeah. molten, you know, magma. And they're just every time you hear an eruption, they're like, "Oh, they're that bad. is the Titans saying, hey, we're still here. <laughs> we're we're still coming here. back for you.' Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Huh? That's crazy. I mean. Just that's just the story of this. Like this, this story is just so fascinating. I mean, obviously, a lot of this is within other, you know, Bibles and different historical and religious texts too. But yeah, this is interesting. The way he's like putting together this uh, the astronomical stuff with it. Well, this time from the Bible of like the angels coming down and mating with humans, and he's placing mm -hmm. that sort of in the same time frame as the Titans uh, being here and doing battle with Zeus. Yep. Which is like the origins, you know, like that's like the creation myths in, uh, in Greek mythology. So it's interesting to see that he's like trying to blend the Greek mythology and the, uh, the Christian. Yep. Um, Abrahamic religion mythologies together here yeah so but what of the story of the fish gods how does that fit in yeah we have seen that many mythologies around the world tell the strange story of the arrival of fish gods and we have touched on the fact that even jupiter in his earliest representations was one of them we have seen too that the myths of jupiter and the other olympian gods are an account of the proliferate proliferation of animal forms bringing these two two things together gives rise to an astonishing possibility could it be that the ancient myths anticipated the modern scientific insights that the animal life um, that would eventually evolve into human form began life as a fish mm. so i see so in this <coughs> case the awanis character is teaching Adam, right? The this proto human, right? But it's mm -hmm. kind of like proto to all life. Right. It's um, kind of all the, it's like it's like the original animal, right? Yep. It's the thing that animals will be born of. Yeah, and so this Awanis fish god is teaching Adam how to be 
fish and how to leave as fish the water for the land. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and it's kind of like it's it's yeah, it's basically what they said, you know, like it's a foretelling of what's to come in yeah. a sense, like just the symbol of it. Yeah. So it's kind of like three different mythologies that are all being blended here. And I don't necessarily understand the how why he he's why he seems to be putting them all contemporaneous with each other because they seem like distinct moments to me. Unless he's just saying like while all this drama is going on with the gods um, there's also it's like heaven and earth like the as above so below type of thing. Right. So while all this drama is going on with the gods like let's check back in with Adam and see where he's right. getting and he's right. being taught what's, how to what's, like what's he learning? leave what's, the ocean and go on the land. Yeah. So yeah, um, we'll pick up uh, right after this break. Cool. We'll go into Darwin's discovery. Ooh. Yeah. We'll be back. do a quick beer review all right yeah i would say what are we drinking but uh it's not yep. me anymore I well, at least for a while it's been a few weeks <laughs> oh yeah since the super bowl <laughs> well no i've had i've had beer since then but it it was like a beer a night for dinner or something but yeah anyway i got the it's like my standard beer i always drink but dean got me some uh, juicy grooves hazy ipa from jackrabbit brewing company which is in West Sac here in town. Yeah. So it's a it's got notes of hoppy it's got hops mo in a mosaic of citra. Citra hops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's six point eight. We're you saying mosaic and citra or a, or a mosaic of citra. Oh no, it says hops. Mosaic citra. Mosaic citra. citra. Yeah. Mosaic hops and citra hops are two different hop varieties. Oh, no. Unless no, they're I'm talking about like a No, it's it's mosaic it's like a, comma citra. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's six point eight percent. I was gonna say unless they hybridized them. It's good. And six I like percent? The, it's six point eight. Six point eight. There you go. And it's super cool, like the graphics on it. I I really like their label. It's got like a guitar as like the main main piece and then a bunch of like musical stuff around it that's kind of like abstract yeah i showed up uh to record today <laughs> and i text drew i was like i'm here and then as well as i was about to text him that i was here to let me in he saw my text asking. i saw yeah he's like hey can you stop by and grow me some beer i was like crap <laughs> Of course, like, yeah. I, and I gave him like a specific, like I want the, I want, oh, you know, like I was like, yeah, he's like, cause he's got, he's got like a like a liquor store right next to where he lives. So I was like, yeah, usually yeah. I assume you're gonna go there, and I've seen their selection, uh huh. So that that was why. No, I ended up <laughs> running off to a local grocery store. I would have been, and fine I realized I it, had left my wallet at home too. So I was like, hopefully they don't ID me. You just but, Apple paid it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just use the Apple Pay. I would have been fine without it, but I appreciate you going out and yeah, going for sure. out of your way. Like, just because I'm not drinking doesn't mean you can't. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> so, yeah, we uh, left off, and I give a little sneak peek at where we're going with this, and it's Darwin's discovery of evolution. Mm. 
So Darwin's discovery of the evolution of species is one of history's great scientific dis discoveries, ranked alongside Galileo, Newton's, and Einstein's. Could it be that the priests of the mystery schools knew of the evolution of species many thousands of years ago, years earlier? Uh, we shall now discover how evidence for this claim, which may initially at least sound implausible, is written across the sky in blazing lights for all to see. Evolution is written across the sky in blazing lights? Mm-hmm. That's what it's claiming. Yeah. I mean, I... That's well, funny yeah, I, think I, like I don't the, as I don't see it as very far fetched for like early people to have discovered evolution way before, right? Well, Darwin. to like understand it, at I mean, least if you to just, understand the idea of it. Yeah, least, yeah, yeah. You you look out like well, when you see chimps, you see monkeys, you see things you see that are things just below that, that, like right, you right. See, if you if you've like cataloged a large chunk of life forms, you can kind even of if just, like if, if it's just in your head, yeah, you can kind of like build taxonomies and see relations. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's not far fetched to understand. And like especially the, when, like, but it's the discovery. If of, you've like, ever the had the technology of like breeding um, plants and breeding animals for like farm use, right? And you gotta assume you understand that you know, right? And 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 early early humans definitely cut things open and ate them. So doing doing um um what's it called um. Um, uh, autopsies or whatever. I, there's another word for it that I'm that I'm searching for, but like cutting something open and finding out the organs of it and uh, like yeah, relating yeah. that to another human that you might have seen. You know, like yeah. being able to like put those things together. Like we all have eyes. Like we all have. You know, like right, right. understanding that there's like a list of things that we all have in common. You know, right. Anyway, so it goes on to talk about or say we are cracking the code of the cosmos. We saw how the earliest episodes in history are to be understood in terms, in terms of the ordered creation of the solar system, one after the other. Saturn, the Sun, Venus, the Moon, and Jupiter. Joined in the work of weaving together the basic conditions that made possible the evolution of life on Earth. Following this sequence has brought us to the dawn of animal life and of consciousness and the beginning of the proliferation of animal forms. In order to, de to understand this, the history of the development of these animal forms, we must turn again to astronomy. And, fo and following on from the sequence in which the ancients believed the planets were created, we now turn to an interlocking sequence, the constellations of the Zodiac. Okay. So that's what they were going like the it's written across the stars in the zodiac. Right. I see. To the ancients, the forces of nature were asleep during the winter and reawakened, exerting their influence anew in the spring. The constellations in which the sun rose in the spring was therefore very important to them. The sun vivifi vivified that constellation, energizing it and increasing its power to shape the world and its history. Right. So this is talking about how, uh, the, to, the, like the idea of like, so like if you're looking out at the night sky, right. Um, a couple hours or so before sunrise and you're looking like due East or due yep. North or whatever, a specific direction on a specific time of the year. And you can see what constellation is there. Yep. And then you see the sunrise in front of it. Yep. Like that. And then it's said to the sun is, is said to be in the house of that, that um, constellation. Right. right. Yeah, no, that's, that's basically the, and then it goes on to talk about the phenomenon of procession of the equinoxes. Mm hmm. Which, um, for, yeah, so we all know that the earth rotates on its axis, mm -hmm. um, and that rotation, if you look each night up at the sky, um, you'll see as we go throughout a year and one half of the year, you'll be able to see a certain set of constellations at the certain time of night, say, call it midnight, whatever. Uh, there will be a certain set of constellations above head. And then on the opposite side of the year, if at midnight, if you look out 
and above, you'll be a totally different set of constellations. Right. And then throughout the year, those like rotate and they also rotate throughout the night. But like, yeah. So like our position around the sun cho changes which constellation we see and it will ultimately change which constellation the sun rises against throughout right. the year. Yep. Yeah, but that's just from our orbit around Earth that causes uh, a different month, essentially, to be a different in a different house of the zodiac. Yeah, and obviously, like <clears throat> when when you start really like going into the astro astronomy and astrology of this all this whole thing is like they were using known markers on their region to dictate what is the most specific, like what's the most. Um, What's the thing they're looking for or looking at? Right. Like what's the what's the thing? Like you see all these different monuments around the world that are pointed in a certain way, or um, um, they have a certain like time of the year where it creates this perfect shadow to create a serpent, like the mm -hmm. Mayan stuff, where mm -hmm. it creates like a serpent that goes down the stairs, and you know it's like crazy, you know. And they all have different based on where they are geologically different things that they're looking to the heavens at yeah based on their that whole procession stuff so that's like the procession of a year right which is mm -hmm. just a, a standard rotation and then our rotation around the sun but then there's another movement that happens it's not just the earth spinning around its axis and then the earth spinning around the sun also the, another movement that the earth goes through is that it's tilted 23 and a half degrees and right that tilt if you ever like spun a top and you notice maybe at first it spins nice and straight but as it starts to lose a little bit of, a little bit of energy it'll start to wobble mm -hmm. that wobble is called precession right because it's proceeding around the center point right in a sense right right and so that's essentially what happens to the earth and its rotation on that 23 and a half degree tilt um that over Twenty three, twenty five thousand or twenty five, yeah. Uh, what is the great year? I think it's like twenty three point seven something. Is a is what the number is stuck in my head. Twenty five point eight thousand yeah. years. It's twenty five thousand nine hundred and twenty or something. This rounds it oh, to okay. twenty eight thousand, twenty five thousand eight hundred. But it's so uh, it rounds it, yeah. Roughly twenty twenty five thousand eight hundred 800 years is the great year, which is the the amount of time it takes to complete a procession of the equinoxes. So the this ages, says... the ages that we experience, right? These zod zodiacal ages, we go one way and then once we get to the end, we go back the other way, right? Isn't that the idea? Uh, no, so of the equinox. like the, you go the way it works the is like the zodiacs, and then you go back through the zodiacs. Um, sort of. So if you're tracking the movement of the sun through the house, so if if on the very first day of every single month of the year mm -hmm. you track um, what the sun rises against mm -hmm. as far as uh, which house of the zodiac, yeah. mm -hmm. it will move in one direction through the months of the year. But right. then the precession causes the uh, that tilt of the earth will rotate like a top backwards. And that rotation causes the, the, the sun to go backwards, basically, in the zodiac from what the monthly precession is. Right. So the sun is going backward, but the... So it's not necessarily that the that the spinning is going backwards. It's that the sun is rising in so, the opposite direction. Yeah, so of we can it, call it like a, a solar month and like a great month, right? So like I a see. solar yeah. month would be you know from a one twelfth of a orbit around the sun, okay? And in a solar month, we'll move forward a zodiac, okay? right? But then in a great month, so in one twelfth of the twenty five thousand year procession. Um, in a solar or in a great month, the sun will move the opposite direction on the zodiac. So it's yeah. So the zodiac is moving constantly or the, in, consistently in the same way, mm -hmm. but it's the sun moving in the opposite direction through the zodiac. Right. So if you track how the sun moves through the zodiac as far as months of the year, it moves 
call it that forward. Call it clockwise. If you call that forward or clockwise, then you would call the uh, great year counterclockwise or backwards. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's why we're moving from. We're in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, as yeah. that song goes. Yep. Are we moving? Is the sun moving in the great year or like backwards or is it moving forward? And that's, that's something to know. But I'll continue here real quick. This phenomenon is known as precession. This is some of the, this, there is some dispute among academics as to when the ancients first became aware of it. The breakthrough book on this subject was Hamlet's Mill, written by Giorgio de Santillana, MIT professor of the history and philosophy of science, and Hertha von Deschend, professor of science at Frankfurt University, and published in 1969. Tremendously uh, erudite, it began a process of rediscovering an astronomical dimension of myths that had long been forgotten outside the secret societies. Their thesis is that one of is that one of the stories central to the all mythology, indeed, indeed all literature from um, Epidus Rex to Hamlet, the story of the dispossessed son who defeats his uncle to regain his father's throne, is a description of an astronomical event, one processional epoch succeeding another. So yeah, so Hamlet's Mill, and uh, Epidus. Uh, Epidus, 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 Rex, Oedipus, Oedipus. That's it, Oedipus. <laughs> Just forget the O, Oedipus Rex. Yeah. So the the stories that were being told in those books early on in 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 time were basically tellings of the procession. Right. Right. So. Here, this is like a basic um, zodiacal chart, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can see oh, here too, that yeah. the way this one's laid out, um, uh, this is moving forward in time through the year. Okay. Going counterclockwise on this chart. Okay. So. Oh, so it's got two dates based on. Right. So, like Aquarius would be, would represent a month in the year before, end. a month before Pisces, right? And then that would be a month before Aries, before Taurus, right? But mm -hmm. in the procession of the equinoxes in the great year, um, we're moving out of Pisces into Aquarius. Into right. Aquarius. And then, so that and would mean. And it was mean actually that we're Taurus, the bull that we were that there was a lot of like this is where like you get like randall and a bunch of people mm -hmm. like talking about like the different symbologies of the different ages and there's a lot of like in um in like m the m moses and the israelites like leaving egypt how and like not how in that age they were talking about like them like worshiping like the bull mm -hmm. as like a false idol and stuff like that's all referring to this like age of taurus um yeah. And then okay. Aries is the water. <laughs> and then Pisces is the fish, right? And that's like sort of the Christian age. That's also kind of the dawning of our most recent age, really. Like that's right. from the beginning of our history, at least as far as we know. Yeah. And then we're we're in Pisces, right? Yeah. We're at the end of Pisces, at the dawn and, of Aquarius. Right. And then from Aquarius... Does it move into Capricorn or does it move back no, into it would Pisces? No, move into Capricorn. Yeah, it just... The great year will go this direction. The great direction. year goes that direction, but the sun... The, the months of the year the procession. go this direction. Gotcha. I'll put this uh, chart up on the, uh, on the screen so you guys can follow what we're saying here. So... Let us now look at this sequence in terms of the historical reality that lies behind the myths of Jupiter and the other gods according to the to esoteric tradition. Because we have been looking at the history as it has been remembered in myths, particularly the myths of the gods of Olympus, we have naturally been picturing to ourselves anatomically modern humans. However, we should continue to bear in mind that these myths represent 
what these things what these things would have looked to the eye of the imagination. But to a physical eye, if any such had existed, it would have all looked very different. I put more references on Barry. Mm -hmm. Because what these imaginative pictures represent is the beginning and development of primitive life forms. If the age of the first marine life was marked by the rulership of the planet Jupiter, then in terms of the procession of the constellations, it was marked by Pisces. When the sun first began to rise in the constellation of Pisces, a new form of condensed, a new form condensed out of the semi-liquid substance of the Earth's su surface, you know, this is the atom semi, you know, liquid form, like plant life. Um, when the, marked by, oh, where am I at? Hold on. A new form condensed out of the semi-liquid substance, right? This was the earliest embryonic form of the fish, somewhat like a modern jellyfish. The ancients conceived of this evolutionary impulse as a god. If primitive life on Earth, the life that we would eventually evolve into, into human life, took on a primitive fish-like form, that was because of a god, because a god took on this form first. So it's as above, so below. Right. So the god took on the form of the fish, and then human, like the the actual life on Earth, took on the the, the form of a the fish. The form of fish. In, yeah, they evolved into fish. Um. Right, and then it goes. Yeah, and that was because God took on the form of the fish, pulled life onto Earth with him. In Egypt. This miraculous event, the birth of animal life, was known as the birth of Horus. And the earliest representations of Horus, like those of Jupiter, were half man, half fish. So we again see that the Greeks and Egyptians, like the Greeks and the Hebrews, worshipped the same god in different cultural clothing. The next processional age was the first age of Aquarius. This was the era of the evolution of amphibians, giant floating creatures somewhat like the modern dolphins but with webbed webbed limbs and lantern like foreheads this lantern was the pineal gland protruding from the top of its of it still holds in some reptiles such as the lizard like tuarta species from new zealand the lantern was still the protohuman creature's main organ of perception this reminds me of that that fish that was discovered like deep in the ocean. Yeah, the one with the the lantern literally mm -hmm. has a lantern coming out of it, and it's As meant like to trap. distraction, meant yeah. to distract things because you know they go for the light. You know, it literally has a light coming out of its head, and it's at the bottom of the ocean. Oh, uh, it's it make I mean, intuitively, like in our head, like. Yeah, that's this it. Thing. Angler, fish. Angler fish. That's the one. You see it in, um, you know, if you have kids and, you know. Dude, those things you look see so it in, um, freaking creepy. I think you see it in Finding Nemo. Yeah, you do. Yeah. If you have kids and, uh, or you just like Disney, Pixar. Yeah, those are creepy. Dude. Oh my God. The teeth <laughs> on that thing. Yeah, Dude. that's that's the image right there. Yeah, this yeah. is the one from Finding Nemo. <laughs> that's freaking terrifying. But look, it's coming from the top of its head, right yeah. out of the middle of its eyes. It's creepy stuff. And that's found today in the bottom of the ocean. Dude, look at that. Are these real pictures? I think that one. Well, is. obviously that one's from Finding Nemo, but. Yeah, there's like yeah, there's a plankton bunch of popular mechanics living off of its light. It looks like yeah, we'll be showing all these images. Well, at least some of them. Dude, <laughs> that thing is dude. Look at the eyeball on it too. It's so weird. Uh -huh. That's a human like eyeball. Look I at know. That. It's got an iris. It's got a. It's got a pupil. Yeah, it's got this like weird dangly thing, like a jellyfish, mm -hmm. like remnant coming out the bottom of it. The deep sea creatures are so crazy, so crazy. Imagine 
Yeah, and I, and I know that there's been fishermen that have pulled those up, but because they're coming from so deep, like a lot of times they'll just let out a bunch of line and they'll grab something and it's one of these fish and they'll pull it up and when it comes up because of the pressure change they're it pulling it up too fast it like explodes, explodes yeah. and it like looks he- like even more insane than what we're looking at like an inside out fish but that looks like that yeah that one's fake that one's real damn anyway <laughs> Freaking anglerfish. Yeah. So this lantern-headed humans were later idealized as unicorns. The earth goddess still told them um, what to do clairvoyantly so that the... I think I skipped one. Yeah, so this is talking about us, the where we, the lineage that's going to end up as us... As humans, yeah. Is at the moment is it still using its like third eye? Yeah, as like not a vestigial thing. Is this like part of the main way that we interact with the world, mm-hmm. and that that represents the unicorn? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. The Earth Goddess still told um, told them what to do clairvoyantly, so that the natural law and the moral law were the same thing. This historical truth is beautifully por- portrayed in the famous tapestry in the Muse de Clunet in Paris, where the unicorn lays its head in the lap of the virgin of a virgin. I don't know, maybe we can find that too. What is that? The tapestry in the Musée de Clun- Cluny. It's Musée, M-U-S-E-E. That's like a... De C-L-U-N-Y. I think, it, I think it's like a museum. De Cluny, this yep. one? Yeah. What are we looking for? The virgin? tapestry. And it's a unicorn laying its head on the ver- on, a, on the lap of a virgin. Our collective memory of the unicorn is, of course, of a haunted creature. Humans might seek sanctuary in the lap of the Mother Earth, but the world was becoming a dangerous place. Yeah, that's it. Or this one. It's one of those, I'm sure. They all look pretty similar. Yeah. The Lady and the Unicorn is what this tapestry is called. But I so think it's it might the idea, be this one. Yeah, it's like the, the visual representation of uh, early human life, you know, confiding in Mother mother Goddess. Mm. So saying the Virgin is the Mother Goddess. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming. Because it also, right before that, talked about how the Mother Earth Goddess still told them what to do clairvoyantly, being these early um, animal forms. Yeah. So we saw that desire had originally existed independently of humankind, and desires continued to exist independently, unintegrated into the proto-human form. These desires running wild were the dragons of mythology. They terrorized the rest of creation. As the marshy surface of the earth began to harden into something like dry land, the next stage of the development of human form began. This was the beginning of the age of Capricorn, when proto-humans developed calves and limbs and to crawl onto land to pursue, to pursue their burgeoning animal desires. According to the ancient wisdom, it was the arrival of Mars that led to the evolution of warm-blooded animals. Mars arrived at the time of the transition from the lizard-like amphibians of the age of Capricorn to the land animals of the age of four-footed Sagittarius. The iron of Mars yielded red blood and provided the conditions that would make egotism possible. And not only in the sense of the healthy drive to survive, as the earth continued to harden and become denser and drier, it shrank further, with the result that one being could, har- could prosper at another's expense. It became part of the human condition that I can hardly move without harming, even killing another living, living creature. Because of Mars, there is o- also a cruel part of human nature that rejoices in this. Mm. Exults in forcing a fellow human being to submit. 
Yeah. So. Yeah, this is all talking about like from the age of Aquarius so we're, to the we're, age of Yeah, Capricorn. we're introducing all these planets yeah. and going through like the evolution of animals essentially right, right. now. And they're also like, yeah, as above, so below. Like, the introduction of these planets to the system are creating these, you know, different forms that we are, you know, at least imaginatively, they yeah. are creating these new forms based on the age of the procession that we're in. Yeah. <laughs> and so what does it say Mars represents exactly? I know like red blood, it said. It said the iron of Mars yielded red blood and provided the conditions that would make egotism possible. Yeah. And not only in the sense of a healthy drive to survive, but and also like the will to kill in order to survive, and then yeah. the, and then uh, the fact that you can't live without killing. You yeah, know? yeah, it became like, like try a, and go throughout your day without ever stepping on a a bug or an ant or or eating something. Yeah, right. right. Eating most things is killing something else. Exactly. It's just a fact of life, and you yeah. have to grasp it. Whether you're a you're a vegan or or a meat eater, right? You're killing a plant in order to survive. Right. You're eating an animal in order to survive. Hmm. Yeah, that's heavy, but we'll uh, we'll come that's back. Like from the break. interconnected nature of death and life. It's the duality of it all, man. Yep. All right, we'll be back. Duality check. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Hey, question to you guys out there. So, like, uh, the music I've been playing through all this is stuff that uh, yeah, we haven't got much feedback on that yet. Huh? I've produced over the years, either myself or myself with my buddy um, Carlo. Um, I guess I should ask him this, but I want to know your guys' opinion too. A lot of the songs, not all of them, like not this one, but a lot of the songs actually have lyrics to them. And Carlo raps, and we have like guest singers and stuff. And I think they're pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think they all I hold do. up. I love that. I love them. Um, anyway, if you're interested in hearing like the lyric versions and stuff, um, well, I'll post links to where you can find the album I was streaming say it. anyway. Yeah, I was say it. And then, um, but I'd be interested to in see if you like. Because there's no reason I couldn't, like, mix those in as the breaks, too. The actual, like, lyrics and stuff? Mm hmm I was just keeping it instrumental to just kind of, like, keep yeah. the vibe going, but... Yeah, let us know if you're into You want to hear some some lyrics on top of what you're hearing? But I should see if Carlos... Let's get some feedback. Too. Let's let's just... Right now, let's, let's ask for some feedback on the music itself and, like, how you guys been feeling about it. Yeah. Anybody who's interested, let us know. 
For show. We know most of the people that we know are going to like have heard it. <laughs> so. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Let's hear from people who haven't heard it. Yeah. So we're going to kind of, we're kind of getting to the end of this chapter. Kind of. Shit. Just turned like four pages, but um, we'll continue a little bit and we'll dive into some more conversation about it. So this chapter has been a commentary on Genesis, taking into account parallel traditions such as the Egyptian and the Greek. This is this way of interpreting or decoding the Bible surfaced among the Neoplatonists and early Kabbalists, Kabbalists and was elucidated by the groups like the Rosicrucians. Much of what we have been considering can be found, for example, in the 17th century writings of Robert Flood. Um, he's a highly influential, um, highly influential on John Milton's Paradise Lost. I don't know, sure, I'm not familiar with that. Paradise Lost um, is a big. Um, I don't know when it came out. Let me see. It's an old and slightly and slightly later Jacob Bohm bomb. I don't know. Uh, I know that Paradise name. Lost is like essentially like and one of the early novels of the world, oh, and it's really? essentially like talking a lot about this like Christian mythology and like heaven and hell, and I believe that's where we get. I might be confusing this with like Dante's Inferno, uh, but that I believe that's where we get a lot of our imagery of like heaven and hell and stuff oh, is from okay. those. And then it talks Paradise about Lost as an epic poem. In blank mm. verse by the 17th century uh, English poet John Milton, 1608 to 1674. First ber version was published in 1667, consists of 10 books with over 10,000 lines of verse. Wow. So this is Robert Flood, his writings on the highly influential Milton's Paradise Lost is what... And uh, slightly later, Jacob Bohm's commentary on Genesis, already mentioned before. Mysterium Magnum, the work of eluc elucidating these commentaries and reframing the wisdom of the Rosicrucians in modern times, was carried out by the great Austrian scholar and initiate Rudolf Steiner, whose anthroposophical, anthro Anthroposophical society perhaps has a very clear claim to be a conduit conduit of the true Rosicrucian stream. Mm. Even outside the esoteric tradition, it is acknowledged that the ancient civ civilizations around the world showed remarkable agreement when it came to these images associated with the sequence of the constellations of the zodiac, which is too is so true. Like you see it all over the world like they have an understanding of the constellations an understanding of the, the stars that yeah like we can't yeah. really fully understand how a they lot got of that. like different cultures even if they have different names and symbols for the stars they're they're similar to yeah and they're in a an order in which you know coincides with others like it's right. so weird yeah. and it's also like the same sort of division of the sky like right. you would think if this was all like separate traditions completely that were coming up with a similar idea that like they would split the sky into 12 different sections right. and each of each culture's 12 sections would not be the same 12 sections mm -hmm. but you would assume yeah except for <sighs> If it's aligned to, no, I guess because if you're doing ast, you would say like the southern hemisphere astronomical alignments, like like you can base your calendar based off of uh, things like uh, the solstice and mm. the equinoxes, where you can tell that like the day length is getting longer, getting longer, oh, getting right. longer, and then getting shorter, getting shorter, getting shorter. So right. these are like like objective measures of like where the extreme ends of your calendar lie. Right. But dividing it into 12 in and of itself is an interesting thing mm -hmm. too. Yeah. And it all kind of like makes me think of like, there's gotta be some kind of like intelligent, like 12 is one of those weird numbers that shows up all over mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. the plays. along with tw- seven and yeah other numbers. But yeah, it's just funny that they would all have these similarities, and the, and all majority of them have like similar tellings of like being taught by some kind of deity that came out of the sea or some ship down the horizon. Check this, or, uh, this website is rsarchive.org. It's the Rudolf, Rudolf Steiner, Steiner Archive. Ooh. It's a whole like free. Oh, cool library with tons of books I said that to me I'm sorry <laughs> the Goethan science a theory of knowledge truth and knowledge these are all books written by Steiner yeah, I'll have those. theosophy those occult out. science case for anthroposophy anthroposophy that's what we were just... Anthroposophy. Posophy. God. Anthroposophy. Anthroposophy. That's an easy word to say. So, we'll, yeah, we'll finish off this uh, these last couple pages here. Um, therefore, back in the book here. Therefore, what is generally regarded as a modern idea that put paid to ancient superstition in an, is, in fact, an ancient idea itself. An understanding of the ordered evolution of the species originated thousands of years before Darwin set sail in HMS Beagle. The secret history was encoded in the imagery of the Zodiac, written down by initiates such as Jacob Bohm and Robert Flood, and um, preserved and carried into modern times by esoteric groups, but always and very deliberately in, in a way that was hard for outsiders to understand. Then, in the 19th century, when the sacred texts of Hinduism were first translated into European languages, much esoteric knowledge, which had previously been carefully managed and controlled, now leaked into the public consciousness. Uh, fascination with these ideas led to a renewed interest in the Kabbalah of the other and other Western traditions and helped fire the craze for spiritualism. Many of the great intellectuals of the period became interested in trying to apply scientific methodology to spiritual and spiritualist phenomena. In 1874, Charles Darwin attended seances with the, with the novelist George Eliot. Darwin's rival, A.E. Wallace, took part in several controlled experiments into spiritualism, believing its phenomena could be measured and verified, just as well as other types of phenomena were. As we shall see later, many leading intellectuals, including scientists, believed that there was something in the esoteric philosophy, and that science and the supernatural would eventually come together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were interested in the stuff, you know, and especially back when when it's, they weren't going to be persecuted. Yeah, and even if they were persecuted, well, this is another were, example of him like pointing out where like some of these famous scientists like they have views that uh, modern modern science would not be is not happy to talk about. Like no one they when they talk about, about Darwin and they talk about the ideas of evolution, no one talks not, about how Darwin was going to seances. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's not something that you're going to hear in any kind of history book. Right. I mean, you would, but like, well, yeah, but you're in like hear a, a passing. deep, detailed, scholarly the history book, maybe. Yeah, but like, you're not going to hear it in. You're a, not going to hear it government. in like your intro to freaking <laughs> right. science class to evolution in, their, in the evolution chapter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Um, continues in the secret in the secret history of evolution of the species was not. The even progress that science supposes, there were twists and turns that have important implications for the way that we understand our physiology and mental makeup. There were dead ends, false starts, and even deliberate attempts at sabotage. According to the secret doctrine, animals evolved into the forms that we are, um, that we are familiar with today, influenced by the stars and planets. Lions by the constellation of Leo, for instance. Bulls by the constellation of Taurus. The cosmic plan was that all the world's biological forms would gradually be incorporated into humankind. 
right? So these symbols and these these gods of the of the zodiac were were intended to like take parts and pieces and be evolved into humankind. And maybe we're still on that path today, right? We're still yeah. taking in like external energy or external this and that to form and evolve slowly over the eons. Like we're still on this path of discovery and, and learning and, you know, based on the Zodiac and, and what's going on above us, things will change here and things are changing here. We know that it's just that we in this time being the, the humans we are today, we only live for a hundred years and you're not going to see much change in a hundred years. Right. And that's the maximum of our life. Like, you know, majority of us are are not going to live even that long. Yeah. This is all interesting too. When you take into perspective that he's still not even saying that anatomically modern humans exist yet at this point in the story. Exactly. So So this is the, and it was talking about the first ages of these constellations. They keep applying this term human to something where like what we think of as human doesn't even exist yet. And so like, what is that definition of human then for them? Right, and how many times through the great year do we have to go? Like, how many times did we go through that great year before we became human? Mm. Where all of these different aspects of all these different godlike, you know, semi-human yeah. gods right. were forming into becoming part of us. Right. I mean, basically, I mean, if you take the scientific numbers of the earth being 4 billion years old and like the first life essentially being as early as like 3.8 billion years Mm -hmm. and basically 3.8 billion years divided by 25,000. That's how many times, right? Which is a ton. Do the math. (laughs) Okay. Do the math. Uh, Hold please. Three. Oh man. How many zeros? This isn't the calculator I want to use. <laughs> Calcbot is way better. Okay, so can you just say billion? That's three point eight million. So that's yeah. three point eight billion. And if we divide that by twenty five thousand years, that's one hundred and fifty two thousand cycles of the Great Year that we've been through. Yeah. Since the beginning. So that's plenty of chances for every single, you know, if if each god of the Zodiac has more influence. To have some kind of influence each on Each one of them had 152,000 times to influence things mm. before now. Not enough. Or maybe it's too many. I don't it's know. a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot in our calculations, but, right? I mean, by those are big, those are big numbers for humans. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it continues. um, As the gods led humanity closer and closer to human anatomy as we know it, they assumed the part animal, part human forms remembered by the Sumerians, the Egyptians, and the Persians, and the Babylonians, until they finally assumed anatomically perfect forms, remembered by the last great civilizations of the ancient world, the Greeks and Romans. For example, the goddess of the planet Venus was cow-headed Hathor, and the god of the planet Mercury was dog-headed Anubis. On the, the walls of Egyptian temples, according to the secret traditions, these same gods, the same living beings, were remembered by the classical Greeks in a later, more evolved form. The ancient texts describing this era also lay great emphasis on giants. The author of the book of Enoch, writing in the Hebrew tradition, and Plato, writing in the Greek tradition, agree that in these early pre-flood times, there arose a race of giants. In fact, traditions of the antediluvian race of giants can be found all over the world, from the Danavas and the Daitas of of India to the uh, Mayatos of, of China, in a dialogue between Midas the um, Phrygian and Salinus 
that has survived the fragmentary form from the same from the time of the Alexander the Great. Um, Salinas says that men grew to double the size of the tallest men in the in his time, and they lived to twice the age. In the secret tradition, the gigantic um, Bamyan statues recently destroyed in Afghanistan were not three giant statues of Buddhas, but three life-size statues of giants of 173, 120, and 30 feet high. The drapery that was made that made them look like Buddhas was made of plaster, said to have been added to the stone later in the 19th century. It was recorded that the locals believed them to be statues of the Mayotes. My, I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, we'll we'll put up pictures of of these um, statues that we, we refer yeah, to. I, I believe we, we put them up in the first, uh, even though we hadn't got the to world. Here, yeah. no, well, they had talked about them. Um, what were they called again? The, the um, Bamyan statues. Bamyan. B a m y a n. Um, the giants of the Chinese tradition. These were the famous statues of Easter Island are also supposed to record the real heights of historical giants. Snakes, spiders, beetles, and parasitic creatures were formed under the malignant influence um, of dark side yeah, of, of the dark ones, side. Remember, of the moon. we looked at these. Yeah, yeah, we did look at them. I think we. I think I had brought them up. I don't know that it specifically mentioned them. Earlier. No, I, th- I thought maybe it they did. did make I a reference it to it, but I think he just made a quick reference. This is kind of talking more about the giants and like what they represent. Yeah, well, it's yeah, an interesting so, idea that these yeah, like, so these are images representations of like the actual size of a giant because they're different sizes too. I, mm-hmm. It almost seems like the 30 foot one was a child and then the 173 foot one was like the full grown adult and the 120 was like an adolescent, you know, like that's what it seems like to me. Yeah. And these were destroyed. Man, that's freaking tragic. It really is. No matter who destroyed them, I mean, it's tragic. This is our history. So, yeah. Then there were the dead-end freaks. The one-legged men, the Batman, the insect men, and the men with tails. Um, Manetho, an Egyptian historian of the 3rd century BC, also recorded traditions of the progeny of the Watchers, writing, They brought double-winged human beings, also other with four wings and two faces, human beings with one body and two heads, Still other human beings had thighs of goats and horns upon their heads. Others had the feet of horses behind them and the men in the front and of men in the front. There were also others said to have been to have been man headed bulls and four headed dogs whose tails emerged like like fish tails from their backs and other monsters such as all kinds of dragon like beings. This then is the era remembered in the great myths and finds echoes in the great fantasy literature such as J.R.R.'s to- Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings and, or the Narnia books of C.S. Lewis. This fantasy literature represents a welling up into the present of a collective memory of this period when humans lived on Earth with giants, dragons, mermaids, centaurs, unicorns, fauns, satyrs, legions of dwarfs, sylphs, nymphs, dryads, and other lesser spiritual beings served the gods and humans rubbed shoulders with sh- rub shoulders with them, fought battles with them, and sometimes fell in love with them. Yeah. Like, this is that uh, period of Orpheus just... falling in love with Eurydice, who was a nymph. Yeah, and, and even like if you were thinking like like straight up, you know, fantasy, like if, if you look at like, like the... Um, J.R. Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and stuff. Like you think of like the the world of men falling in love with the world of elves and like mm-hmm. all these different, you know, subcategories of humans and non-humans and orcs and you know all these different like yeah. giants were among them and yep. tree-like beings were also among them. Yeah. And, you know, like these were all living in a time together that eventually, you know, subsided and and ended. Yeah. And that's super interesting, and I can't wait until we um, 
start covering some books about giants and stuff yeah. because they're there's some evidence. it's more than just like people talking talking it up like there is there's some history there's some weird archaeological finds yeah some of them fake but some of them like you can't just yeah. label fake some, of, just some the, stuff that gets found and then just gets a uh, shoveled to the back of a museum and never seen again right yeah the smithsonian's fa famous for that right yeah in the secret history the last creatures to incarnate before humans were the apes they came about because some some human spirits rushed into incarnation too early before human anatomy was perfected in the secret history therefore it is not right to say the humans were descended from ape apes Rather, that apes represent a degeneration of humankind. Of course, no fabulous creatures have, um, have left any trace in the fossil record. So why have great men and women of history, initiates of the secret societies, believed in them? Why should any intelligent person even begin to toy with the idea? All right. That That's ends that question. chapter. Oh, oh. That leaves us on a little cliffhanger of it. Cool. Like, why cool. should we believe in, you know, if we have no fossil records of it? It's like, the earth has been through just as much as humans have, you know? Like, yeah. the earth itself. I mean, I don't know that I we, believe that, like, literally right. there was, like, as much crazy, right. like, life diversity as, like, in a Tolkien book or something. But... But we know that Neanderthals lived on the same planet. We know that Neanderthals and Denisovans and humans coexisted. We know that the Hobbit people of Indonesia, um, I forget what their um, classification term is, um, but they're like the the little peoples, basically. Yeah. They're another branch they're like off. They're four-foot humans or They whatever. coexisted. So yeah. already we've got... Neanderthals, which are basically like big humans, yeah, more big, muscular, mm -hmm. strong, fast, bigger brain, better for yeah. You bigger got Denisovans, brain. which look totally different. Then you got these Hobbit people, and you got uh, anatomically modern humans all walking around the same Earth at the same time. Yeah, and there was that other. Um, there was but another that one looks that was not too crazy far off from yeah. like a Tolkien so you got like, story. Yeah, exactly. You got like Hobbit like things, and then you got like Neanderthals who look orc like in mm -hmm. the sense where they got mm -hmm. like this these features that aren't exactly human, right? And just like the orcs they're, look, they look human like, but they're not exactly human, right? Like we don't know the physical makeup. We know what the bones look like of Neanderthals, but we don't know what their skin, what their they actually were physically so much look more like. They're like dense. Robust. Yeah. yeah. Like we know that they were better at doing the things to survive, like physically. Like, yeah, like they were just they were they were stronger than us for damn sure. For damn sure, yeah. Uh, and there was that recent Y Files episode on it, dude. That was such that a good is episode. such a good episode. I'm and, all look, make sure to we'll link, link that because that's a great episode. Um, the Y Files is a great. Um, YouTube channel and everybody should check it out. Anybody who listens to our podcast it, and loves this kind of stuff, they dive into a lot of different types of conspiracy theories and and whatnot. In fact, uh, I might test. But they out also debunk new, a lot of this stuff too. So yeah, if you're, I might if test you're out my new setup that, here. Um, you want to do it? Well, yeah, we're gonna take a break here in a second. But during our break, I'll try and cue up that portion of that Y Files episode yeah. where he describes the, the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals, yeah, let's do which that. Which is a they do a good job of like putting you in the moment and like describing stuff. So we'll That's maybe we'll idea. open with that. That's a good idea. Let's do that. Um, let's just go ahead and start the break now. Might as well. Okay, cool. Well, we will be back in just a few minutes. Yeah, we're at the end of the chapter. Might as well. Cool. Cue it up.
excited for this. This is our first time trying this. Yeah. So on the topic of what we were just talking about with like all these different species coexisting and it's sort of looking like a Tolkien uh, esque world. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a little snippet from an episode of the Y Files. This is a, their YouTube channel, which I'll link to. This is the episode Humans vs. Superhumans when monsters were real and we almost went extinct. Yeah, and this episode dropped just uh, in mid January. So it's only about a month old. So it's a great one. You should go back and watch it. Definitely. But yeah, check out this little snippet to get an idea. You are not who you think you are. Well, you're human, but we Homo sapiens weren't the first type of humans. Just 50,000 years ago, various species of humans shared the planet with us at the same time, and they were everywhere. Denisovans settled in Russia. Floresiensis traveled all the way to Indonesia. Luzonensis traveled through Asia and all the way down through the Philippines. And of course, there's us, Homo sapiens. We evolved in Africa, then moved into the Arabian Peninsula and spread to other parts of Asia, Australia, Europe, and the Americas. In time, Homo sapiens would colonize every habitable region on Earth. But that would take thousands of years, because there was something or someone standing in the way of our progress. Another species of human. A species of human that was stronger, faster, and more adaptable to extreme environments. This fearsome and fearless warrior species was the Neanderthal. The Neanderthal was not the dumb, bumbling caveman you were taught in school. They were intelligent, had spoken language. They built large family groups that organized into tribes, that then organized into villages. They conquered fire. They created art. They created music. They created tools. But their specialty was creating weapons. This species of superhuman warriors conquered Europe easily. They crossed the English Channel and conquered Britain. The warm coasts of the Mediterranean, too, were theirs. For five yeah, so it goes on to, this yeah. whole episode like goes on to like detail the war between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens for our survival. Yeah, and um, we eventually won out. Yeah. You know, but there is also a mixture of of Neanderthal, like the idea of like the, like we were just talking about, like the mixture of like, falling in love or at least, you know, reproducing with other creatures that are similar and that right. you could reproduce with. Like right. we humans still have Neanderthal DNA within us. Mm -hmm. And Denisovan DNA. Yeah. So there's obviously, you know, interbreeding going on between these, you know, early humanoid creatures. Yeah. You know, and if you believe this, I, this account or this idea that Neanderthals might've been, you know, this warlike species that terrorized humanity or terrorized all living creatures, it directly links back to what was to what we talked about earlier. Right. Like the Titans. So doing even the if same you don't thing. believe like as the secret history wants like is like asking you to consider like even if you don't believe to, that it's like yeah. half half human, half animal hybrids, and if you don't believe that there's like unicorns and crazy dragon creatures um like still you you have to contend with the fact that there was multiple um versions of humanity of mo multiple like human like human like species that all coexisted at once yeah and were essentially competing with each other for survival yeah well and eventually like they they coexisted for a time but of, of course, like any society today, they have conflict. Right. There's right. always going to be conflict. There's always going to be border border issues, right? Mm -hmm. There's never a perfect society. Like even with the like the Denisovans and the and the Florensiensis, like these these hobbit like creatures, like humans also probably had a hand in their demise. Right. Outside of the Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't all just this like perfect world of everybody coexisting. Like otherwise, you'd have these different species on the They'd earth all still, still today. Be here, right? You know, like, and this is going back to that idea of like egotism and like the beginning of that, and like mm. knowing that these all these creatures had it because they're human-like, right? These are like the the 
precursors to humanity, which is like the ultimate thought of what is to be on earth. Yeah. Yeah. And whether that was the Neanderthals in the end or us, you know, it was, it's obvious within the story, right? Within Mark Booth's story of the history of the secret history of the United, of the world, like there, the idea is that like, they had a, an idea of what was to be created and what they wanted to create. And if there was like, and the idea that we just covered, like um, the first incarnations of humans was, was apes because humans were just so ready to like the spirit of humans that they, that and they initially incarnated was, was into apes because they were just so ready to, to go and experience yeah. that they jumped into these ape like beings and formed conscious and like gave their consciousnesses to these ape like beings. That's like, like that kind of explains like this, like there's the missing link idea, right? Right. Like this, this idea that there's no real link between apes and us, but there's all these other like Neanderthals and all these other creatures that also incarnated at the same time. And once the human form was created, the human, the homo sapien, I guess in this idea, or maybe multiple, right? Maybe there was multiple. Yeah. Like all these different species. That's when all of the spirits of the of what was to be conscious on the earth formed, but then there was egotism from you know Saturn and and Venus and all these different god like you know that gave us all these um, less than great you know characteristics, but still part of our human being and still part of our condition. Like we have to accept that. We have to accept the duality of our nature. Yeah. You know, looking back, it's just a, you know, it's fascinating to think about. But I don't know if we're going to get into this next chapter because this is a fascinating topic all on its own. But what, uh, do we, we still have more on this chapter or that's the end? That of it? was the end of this chapter. We can get into it a little bit at least. Sawyer's, Sawyer's moving around a bit. We'll see, uh -huh. see if he settles. Looks like he'll settle. But yeah, so we'll, we'll at least start this next chapter. It's chapter six of the Secret History of the World. Um, the Assassination of the Green King. Isis and Osiris. The Cave of the Skull. And the Palladium. So, yeah, we'll at least get through this introductory and give people an idea. And we'll, we'll talk about it a bit. But in the period described... By the myths of Olympus, gods walked among humans, but the history of the last god to rule the, as king of the earth is recorded in its fullest versions in Egyptian rather than Greek tradition. <coughs> the Egyptians unquestionably believed that their most important god had once walked among them, led them into battle, and ruled them wisely and well. Herodotus described a visit to the shrine where Osiris was said to be buried. Gigantic stone obelisks stand in the courtyard, and there is a circular artificial lake next to it. It is on this lake at night that the Egyptians act out the mysteries. The black rite that celebrates the death and resurrection of the being whose name I dare, to, dare not speak. I know what goes on, but... Say no more. Fortunately, we can supplement these teasing accounts with the history of Os uh, with the history of Osiris, as told by Herodotus' near contemporary Plutarch, an initiate priest of the Oracle of Delphi. In the following, I have used Plutarch's accounts as a basis, weaving in additional material from other sources. We have to start by imagining a world at war. Ravaging by roaming monsters and wild animals, again. Yeah, the same idea. That, you know, right. like wild things, and you know, Neanderthals and other beings like us. Right. Right. Osiris was a great. We have to start by imagining. Oh, that's no, right. Osiris was a great hunter, a beast master, remembered as Orion, the hunter in Greek mythology. Um. And, he, and 
and uh, Hearn the Hunter in Norse mythology and a great warrior. He cleared the land of predatory beasts, right? Mm -hmm. He was one of the human champions, right? That yeah. helped clear the land of these beasts that were, that were plaguing them. A great warrior. But this great warrior's downfall came not in combat with monsters or, or not or on the battlefield, but because of the enemy within. Returning from another military campaign, Osiris was welcomed back by cheering crowds by the populace who loved him. The reign of Osiris, though constantly under attack from outside the country, would be remembered as a golden age, and it was an age of domestic as well as civil bliss. His name is connected with insemination, Osirian, meaning sem semen, and what we today call the belt of Os or Orion, is a euphemism in ancient times. It was a penis that became erect as the year progressed. These, these things should alert us to the fact that there is a strong sexual, sexual current in the history that follows. Osiris accepted an invitation from his brother Seth, to a gala dinner to celebrate victory. Some said Osiris had been sleeping with beautiful dark-skinned um, Nephthys, wife of Seth, and sister of his own wife, Isis. Did this provide Seth with the motive for murder? We may not have, or he may not have need, needed one. The clue to um, Seth's animosity is contained in his name he was an envoy of satan after dinner seth announced a game he made a beautiful chest something like a coffin but fashioned out of cedar and inlaid with gold silver ivory and lapis lazuli whoever fitted most neatly in this chest he said could take it away one by one guests tried but there were too fat, too thin, too tall, too short. Finally, Osiris stepped in and lay down. It fits, he cried. Fits me like the skin I was born in. But his pleasure at winning was cut short as Seth slammed down the lid. Seth's hammer in na Seth hammered in nails filled every crack with molten lead, the metal of Satan. Then Seth and his followers carried the chest down to the banks of the Nile and cast it into the waters. Osiris was an immortal, and Seth knew he, was, he couldn't kill him, but he could, he believed, get rid of him for good. The chest, the chest floated down the Nile for several days and nights, eventually washing ashore on the coast of what we now call Syria. A tender, young, tamarisk tree growing... <coughs> Excuse me. Growing there, wrapped the chest in its branches and eventually grew all around it, enclosing it lovingly and protectively in its trunk. In time, this tree became famous for its uh, splendor, and the king of Syria had it chopped down and fashioned into a pillar, stood in the center of his palace. <laughs> in the meantime, Isis separated from Osiris. <laughs> and deposed from her throne, cut her hair, blackened her face with cinders, and wandered the surface of the earth, searching tearfully for the, her beloved husband. Husband, After a while, she took a job as a servant, servant girl at the court um, of a foreign king. That same Syrian king. Yeah. But Isis never gave up. Never gave up hoping that, to find her man. And one day, her magic powers led her to, to see Osiris clairvoyantly in the chest inside the tree in the middle of the very palace where she was working. The palace of the Syrian king. Isis revealed her true identity as the queen, as the queen and it persuaded the king to chop down the pillar and let her take the chest away. She left by boat and landed on the island of uh, Chemis in the Nile Delta. There she intended to use her magic arts to reveal her husband. But Seth had magic powers too. 
he and his evil cohorts were hunting by moonlight, and in a vision, Seth suddenly saw Isis cradling Osiris. While she lay sleeping, he swooped down upon the loving couple, determined to make the time um, to, to make sure this time he attacked Osiris with savage glee. <coughs> <coughs> Hacking him into fourteen different pieces, and and he then had hidden in secret, different secret, in secret in different places, corners of the land. So the widowed Isis had set out on her travels again. It should be known that free, Freemasonic readers will perhaps be aware that they call themselves sons of the widow, partly as a mark of their um, precipitate participation in her quest mm. so the free the, the freemasons are part of the quest of isis to yeah. restore the body of osiris yep isis wore seven veils to disguise herself from seth's minions and was aided by nephthys she also loved osiris she was the wife of seth nephthys um isis wore the seven veils right yeah. Osiris and now turned herself into a dog to f to find and dig up the parcels of Osiris's corpse. They retrieved all of them except, except the penis. Yeah. Yep. Which had been eaten by the fish in the Nile. Another more fish. Mm. Was that Oanis? <laughs> Maybe. They arrived at an island in Abydos in southern Egypt. And there, at night, Isis and Nephthys bandaged all the remaining parts together using a long, winding piece of white linen, the first mummy. Hmm. Finally, Isis fashioned a penis out of gold and attached it. She was not able to bring, um, bring him wholly back to life, but she revived Osiris sexually so that she was able to hover, touching him gently and delicately while she enveloped his penis in the form of a bird. Until he ejaculated in the way she in this way, she impregnated herself on him, <clears throat> and in the same way, Horus, the new master of the universe, was conceived. Yeah. <coughs> huh. Egyptian mythology is cool, man. It's so cool. I've been fascinated by Egyptian mythology for so long, but yeah, it's just so in in. It's so, it's so like, um, um, like it's just got so much imagery involved mm -hmm. and, and it's all so like, like none of it really makes sense. You know, if you were to think about it, like, you know, like normally, literally, literally, yeah, exactly. Realistically. <clears throat> but there's so much, um, metaphor. And there's so much um, to to be like learned about and to like understand about it. But there's some interesting building blocks in there that um, seem to repeat themselves too, like uh, the setting Osiris down the river. It sounds a lot like uh, was it Moses that got sent down the river in the Bible. Um, and what other elements in there? Well, but the hacking into pieces. That sounds. Can't place it, but that like rings a bell for something else that I'm comparing it to. Mm hmm. It's almost like the Olympians hacking the uh, Titans down into pieces and throwing them, scattering them down into the Tartarus. Earth. In the underworld um does he uh does he talk about like the symbolism of that um a little bit yeah he he goes on to say what the hell does all this mean yeah how can we decode it on one level it seems to represent the seceding of one constellation by another in the procession of the equinoxes horus deposes seth and supplants him on another level, perhaps the most obvious one, it is a fertility myth about the yearly cycle of the seasons. The appearance of the star Sirius on the horizon after months of being hidden was a sign to the ancient Egyptians that 
Osiris would rise again shortly after afterwards, and that the inundation of the Nile was due was due. Myths of the resurrected God King were told all around the world, from uh, Tammuz and Marduk to the Fisher King stories associated with Parseval and the King Arthur cycle. Mm. They follow the same pattern. The king is fatally wounded, typically in the genitals, and while he lies suffering, the land stays barren. Then, oh. in the spring, a magical operation is performed, and he rises again. So, <clears throat> yeah, it goes on to talk about how, like, this is a symbolism of the times and the era that they're in. Like, you know, like... These are all obviously historical teachings and, and, and tellings. Like they're like they knew at the time that telling a story, a fascinating story, is the most um, is is the best way to actually get the point across of what's going on. But it's so esoteric that the layman, the person that's not doing any of the actual reading, the person that's just hearing it, isn't going to get it. They're not going to know what's going on here. Right. They're not going to know that it's a procession of the equinoxes and that there there are cycles going on on the earth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it goes on, and I'll read this bit too, just because we got a little bit of time still. Um, to get to the truth of it, we now... We now need to look at a similarly bizarre and distor disturbing story from the Greek myths. We know that Plutarch from an from um, that in antiquity, sorry, we know from Plutarch that in that in antiquity Osiris, the last god king to the to rule the earth, was equated with Dionysus, the last king of Olympic gods, the last of the Olympic gods. Sorry, the sources disagree on the subject of Dionysus' parentage. Some say his father was Hermes, others Zeus. All agree that the little, that the little God's mother was Mother Earth. Mm. And that, as with Zeus, she hid the infant Dionysus in a cave. Dionysus, like Zeus, represents the evolution of a new form of consciousness, and again, the Titans were determined to nip it in the bud. Again, we see that the Titans are consciousness eaters. <clears throat> um, uh, Dionysus, like Zeus, represents the evolution of a new form of consciousness. Oh, I just heard that. Yeah. Um, they smear their faces with white gypsum to conceal their identity as the black-faced sons of the crow god. They didn't want the frightened Dionysus as they lured him... They didn't want to frighten Dionysus as they lured him from the cradle hidden in the neat uh, niche of the black of the back of the cave. Suddenly, suddenly the Titans fell on Dionysus, tearing him into pieces. They flung him, they flung these pieces into a boiling cauldron of milk. They tore the meat from the bones with their teeth. Meanwhile, Athena had stolen into the cave unnoticed, and she snatched away the the goat boy's heart before it could be cooked. She took this to Zeus, who cut open a hole in his thigh, inserting the body part in, in and sewed it up again. After a while, Athena, just as Athena had sprung fully formed from the head of Zeus, the reborn Dionysus sprang fully grown from Zeus's thigh. Again, going back to the yeah, parthenogenesis, parthenogenesis aspect of it all. Yeah. In order to understand, but that's that, also like a, a resurrection tale within it, mm -hmm. which is cool. Yeah. Um, as far as the historical, um, the secret history part goes, in, in order to understand the historical reality behind this mystery and the parallel story of Osiris, it is necessary to remind ourselves that in this account of the history of the universe, matter was only precipitated out of the cosmic mind over very long periods and was only very gradually developing towards the sort of solidity and, um, we are familiar with today. It is also as well to remind ourselves again that although we may view of the great figures of myths, both gods and humans, as having anatomically or as being anatomically like our own, it is only however or only how they appear in the eye of the imagination. Right. So again, this is all imagery in a, like to suggest like to get us to understand that this is 
non-human like stuff like this is pre-human stuff still going on so this is i wonder is this all taken to mean like sort of the origin of like seasons on the earth then or is it meant it sounds like he's also saying it's a. It has to do yeah. with the change of consciousness as well. Yeah, it's almost. I'm similar. not picking up all the symbology for what that change of consciousness represents. Like, in what way is consciousness changing it in that? Well, I think maybe consciousness is changing to understand that there are cycles upon the earth that that directly affect us. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, like. The human like proto humans at the time are a subject to this non physical changing of the universe. Right? Like we are directly, you know, as above, so below. It's like this this constant idea of like as things change above, things will change down here. And our consciousness is directly linked to the changing of, you know, what's going on on Earth. Right. And that Earth is directly ch changed by what's going on in the cosmos. Yeah. So humans have a link to Earth. Earth has a link to the cosmos. The cosmos has a link to the, to the, to the universe and so on and so on until you get to the original thought. Right, but I guess, like, specifically these stories, the story of Osiris, the story of uh, mm -hmm. Dionysus here, mm -hmm. like, what do those specifically, like, what sort of change in consciousness do those represent at the moment? Yeah. I, but I, I, I think it, we'll get into that. Yeah, I think it continues on, but I don't know if we want to pick it up again on the next episode, but... Unless, um, do you, do you well, see it right well, there? Not specifically, but we can finish that, at least on this part. Um, okay. The world looked very different to the physical eye that were evolving to at this time. This was still the world recorded in the metamorphose of the initiate poet Ovid when the anatomically form anatomical forms of humans and animals were not fixed as they are now. A world of giants, hybrids, and monsters. The most anatomically advanced humans were evolving the two eyes that we have today. But the lanterns of Osiris... The third eye. ...still protruded from the middle of the forehead where the bone of the skull had not yet hardened. Gradually, though, um, matter became denser and the, more, and the more important point to bear in mind here is that despite the fact that matter was precipitated from mind, it was alien from mind. Right. To, to the extent that matter hardened, it became a greater barrier to the free flow of cosmic mind. Yeah, so it's basically talking about how like the our consciousness is being changed because we are being lesser and lesser. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are having lesser and lesser um, actual understanding of what's going on in the cosmos as a human form hardens further and further. So all these things are happening in the cosmos to change things on earth and the earth is hardening. And because the earth is hardening, we are hardening in our, in our third eye, the pineal gland, this, this lantern is hardening and crystallizing and we're becoming less and less able to understand what's going on out there right in the sort of spirit realms <clears throat> yeah um, so i think that's kind of is what you're 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 searching, searching for, for there a bit yeah so maybe that sort of death and rebirth is like a death and rebirth into a new consciousness of more physical less more materialistic and less, and less spiritual. spiritual yeah yeah mm. it's fascinating right because whichever god it is is ripped into pieces and you're you're reconstructing from you yeah know, from, and you don't have all the parts right, right you don't have this right. sexual the the sexual gland right that they're talking about the sexual organ which is you know if you were to think about it it's like the 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 generation of the future really like right. the sexual organ is like like we know it you know, in our human form is like, that's our future. Like it's like setting, like creating another life form, you know, 
and and teaching it the ways of your life and the ways of the world like this cosmic uh, sexual act is the same same way right hmm. like we read Neil deGrasse Tyson's quote before like the yeah yeah you know like the the death of a star is the birth of an entire solar system basically right cool <laughs> i love this book man i could do this all this day. chapter yeah i struggle these with that one a little bit yeah but. no these chat these two chapters are are very esoteric totally and they, they definitely want you to like you have to work for the symbolism in yeah a lot more yeah and i don't know that we nailed it down either but i right. think that we're getting into it a little bit yeah well cool it's been a fun one Definitely. um I'm excited for our next one. I started uh, I, I'm about halfway into that Chris Blitz of interview. So, oh, I'm how do you like it so far? To talk about it. So far, so good. Like, uh, like I see what you're saying. Like, he doesn't come off. Like, he doesn't set off my BS meters. Not, not, not really. At yeah. least not super glaringly, as far as mm. I've gotten into it so far. So, I'm excited to keep. He continues that it. for the rest of it too. I yeah. think you'll enjoy it, and I think it's gonna be. Uh, and he's been doing this since for so long, right? But he's mm -hmm. not like the re there's a reason we haven't heard of him. At least we haven't discovered his whole story yet. Yeah. And we're yeah. super into the topic, but we haven't like like there's a reason for that and I don't he's definitely a fascinating character. Heck yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, uh, thanks for listening. If uh give him our plugs. Yeah, the plugs. Uh, <laughs> check us out on YouTube. Check us out on Rumble. Uh, follow us on our social media. We're on Facebook, X, Instagram. Yeah. Um, That's where you'll see. Well, X less, but mostly Facebook, Instagram. You'll see us posting well, weekly. Well, actually, I need those passwords from you again because oh, okay. I actually tried to go out. I was like, what the heck is our X password? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe we should I, start posting I was going to start posting on there and on TikTok for us, but... Anyway, we'll be seeing more of more. that. Um, hopefully, you don't have to see an, an entirely rebuilt website, but you might. You might. Hopefully, um, it'll look similar, and maybe we'll upgrade it a bit based on the things we know now. Yeah, but let us know your thoughts on the show. What uh, what uh, is this uh, secret history of the world causing to stir in your mind? What, yeah. Uh, what, what's the symbolism that you're picking up from it? Yeah, and please we'll, we'll, tell us your thoughts. On each of the episodes that we do this book, we'll add the links to the book itself. Mm -hmm. And I hope you go and read it. Or there's an audio book version there's of it. There's an audio book version and there's a physical illustrated version, which yeah, is really Yeah, you get a bunch of cool pictures and we'll we'll link a bunch of these pictures. I've got a bunch of them starred out here. So yeah, you can email us by just messaging us on Facebook or Instagram or yeah. X. Or you can also uh, email us directly at hosts at do dualitycheck.net yes our website may or may not be up at the time of you trying to get to us so check us out we'll on still get socials. the email but yeah right the emails will work but um check us out on uh, socials for sure and also this is our first time using um a web browser as audio so yeah yeah i'm let us know how we're you we're gonna incorporate about more like audio clips and stuff uh yeah, because we want to be able to watch stuff and like let people hear it at least, yeah. and then link it, and then hopefully people will discover. Sometimes something new. people say those stuff like in really cool voices, and it's hard yeah. to like, like, yeah, we're we not want to wipe that it. up and like tell yeah. it in our boring voice by rereading it, where we can like have someone else who's already read it like That's sound right. beautiful, and then we can just comment on it. Yep. But, this is anyway. our first attempt at that. So let us know. Episode eleven down. We'll boom, be boom, back. Boom the beginning of the zodiac and we're in number 12 number 12 next week. love you guys take care adios mm -hmm.